This meeting is being recorded. Good morning and welcome to the Word Line. This is Elder Charmaine Ernest and I welcome all of you this morning. Let us open with prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus and by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, we just wanna say thank you. We thank you for this opportunity to come before you this morning and bring a word to your people. Lord, thank you for this assignment that we have been given. We lift up all of those that are hearing us. Uh, we lift up the visionary of this ministry, Elder Barbara Trotter, keep us safe, protect her. And Lord, we just ask that you would open our hearts, speak through us, open our minds and our mouths and minister to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. I have been given the assignment today to uh, speak on 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'm going to share my screen, chapter 5, verses um, 9 through 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 11. And the topic of my class today is church discipline. Church discipline. I'm going to read from the Amplified Bible as well as the King James Version of the Bible. Reading from the Amplified verses 9 through 11, it says, I, Paul, wrote you in my previous letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Verse 10, not meaning the immoral people of this world or the greedy ones and the swindlers or the idolaters. For then you would have to get out of the world and human society altogether. And in verse 11, it says, but actually I have written to you not to associate with any so-called Christian brothers or sisters if he is sexually immoral or greedy or is an idolater devoted to anything that takes the place of God or is a reviler one who insults or slanders or otherwise verbally abuses others or is a drunkard or a swindler. You must not so much as eat with such a person. Now, I'm gonna read it in the King James. It says, 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11. It says, uh, I, write, I wrote unto you in an epistle, not to company with fornicators, Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then you must need get out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, a covetous, an idolater, a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with, so, with such as at one not know not to eat. The topic for today, church discipline. Now these verses are telling us, it's only three verses and they're telling us that the born again believers are not to associate or have company with other born again believers who live as fornicators, covetous, greed. Uh, a fornicator is a person who's having sex outside of the marriage covenant. Uh, then the greedy persons or the covetous people are people with an intense selfish desire for wealth or power. The idolaters is someone who's devoted to anything that takes the place of God. That's what an idolater is. A greedy person is a person who has an intense selfish desire for wealth or power. A fornicator is anybody who's having sex outside of marriage. I, do, I told my son, I said, they call that sex, uh, having sex, sinful sex. And, but when you're married, you can have sex without sin. Now, a reviler or a railer is one who insults, slanders, or verbally abuses another. We should not be insulting, slandering, or verbally abusing other people. A drunkard, is one who is habitually drunk, not a drinker, because the Bible tells us we can, we can drink, but we should not habitually engage in the overindulgence of alcohol. That is what a drunkard is. And a swindler, an extortioner, is a person who uses deception to deprive someone of money or possessions. They're stealing 
they, but they, they, they are deceiving you and you don't even know that they're deceiving you. That's a swindler or an extortioner. Now, these lists of sins are referred to as the sins of immorality. In these verses, these verses state in verse 10, it says that he told you not to associate in nine, not to associate with sexually immoral people, not meaning the immoral people of the world. In other words, the unsaved people of the world, the greedy ones, the winless, these are the, these are the people who are not saved. Because if you were to not associate with them, you would have to get out of the world. Because all of human society, unsaved people, is built on these people. These verses are not telling the born again believers to not associate with or have company with the unsaved, the lost people of the world who live like that because that is who makes up the whole world. It is God's job to judge the lost of the world, the unsaved of the world, the swindlers, the fornicators, the, all of those people who all of us at one time was a part of that. Somewhere we was in that list, okay? God judges the lost of the world. Our job as born again believers is to police each other in the church. That is what church discipline is. God tells us how to do that at Matthew, the 18th chapter, verses 11 through 17. These verses tell us how to do church discipline. It says, a parable of the lost lamb. In verse 11, the son of man, Jesus, has come to give life to all of those who are lost. He comes to give life to the greedy, to the extortioners, to the drunkards, to the idolaters, all of those. That's what he came to do, give us eternal life. But then in verse 12, he said, think of it this way. If a man owns a hundred sheep and one lamb wanders away and gets lost, won't the man leave the 99 grazing at the hillside and go search for that one lost lamb? And if he finds his lamb, his lost lamb, he's going to rejoice over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. Now, you should understand that it is never, 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 never the desire of your heavenly father that any single one of these little ones should be lost. First of all, you got to realize that you was in the 99. You was in the 100. And something happened, you got caught up and you fell away into some sin problem. And, but God ain't gonna never leave you. You might walk away, but God don't leave you. And then it talks in verse uh, 15, it talks about restoring broken relationships because that's what sin does. It affects our fellowship with God. It says, if your fellow believer sins against you, this is what three things that the church how are we supposed to do uh, church discipline when a believer sins? One, you must go to that, that person privately and attempt to resolve the matter. If he or she responds, then your relationship is restored. So go to them privately, not with your friends. Don't go talking about it with your sisters and your cousin. Go to them privately and attempt to resolve the matter. And if they respond, then the relationship is restored. But if his or her heart is closed to you and they don't want to hear what you got to say, then you do number two. And number two says, then you go to him or her again, taking one or two others with you as witnesses. You'll be fulfilling what the scripture teaches when it says, let every word may be verified by the testimony of two or three witnesses. In other words, go back to them, bring in two or three people with you, that, and you're gonna try to resolve this relationship, okay? And talk about the problem. Then in verse 17, and if he or she refuses to listen the second time, it is your job then. And the third thing you're supposed to do is then you, Share the issue with the congregation, the church, in hopes of restoration. Now, if he or she still refuses to respond, even to the church, 
then you must disregard him or her as though they were an outsider on the same level as an unrepentant sinner. In other words, they still saved. They still a child of God. But church discipline must always be for the purpose of correction and not damnation. None of us have the right to tell a person they've lost their salvation. All we can do is uh, correct them in hopes of restoring them. Now, the man we read about for the, for in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 13, repented. And Paul told the believers to restore him back into fellowship. It, he says that in 2 Corinthians 2, 7 through 8. It says, instead of more punishment, what he or she needs most is your encouragement through your gracious display of forgiveness. I beg you to reaffirm your deep love for him or her. In other words, if they repent, love them back, put them back, restore them. There are three major areas for church discipline that the Bible references. Number one is disorderly conduct in 2 Thessalonians 3, 16 through 15. The next one is doctrinal issues that must not be tolerated. 1 Timothy 1, 19 through 20, 2 Timothy 2, 17 through 18, Revelations 2, 18 through 29, and Titus 3, 10. And the sins of immorality that we just addressed in our scriptures for today. Those are the three major areas that for church discipline. The scriptural demands of church discipline are designed to help restore the brother or sister who is in sin just as much as they are designed to protect other members of the church body from that sin issue, not from the person, from the sin. If the person being disciplined repents, the objective has been achieved and, not, and no further action should be taken. Love them back into the, the congregation. Church discipline should be followed based on biblical guidelines and not based on the carnality of people who choose to be mean and treat people wrongly in the church, resulting in a lot of church hurt. Don't let the devil use church discipline as a means to cause church hurt. Everything must be done God's way, and that will lead to repentance and restoration. And if there's anyone out there that would like to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior, say you've been hurt, you've been church hurt, and you, you are still a child of God. Even if they've disfellowshipped you, they've churched you, they've excommunicated you, there's all different kind of words people use. You are, you are all still a child of God. God loves you. Jesus took care of all of your sins. He just wants you to be restored and he said, don't forsake the assembly of yourself. Come back, get involved, and allow the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you to continue to teach you. But if there's anybody out there that's unsaved and want to get saved, repeat these life-changing words after me. Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and that God raised Jesus from the dead. I now receive my salvation and my righteousness. I now receive the forgiveness of my sins and eternal life. And I now receive my divine mental and physical health. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You said those words for the very first time. You just got saved. And the, the scripture said there's a party going on in heaven right now. And that party, it, it said, uh, we want to rejoice with you all the time when you get saved because Ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party because the Holy Ghost party don't stop. Ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party because the Holy Ghost party don't stop. Now, I want to wish all of you a blessed day in the Lord. And if you ever encounter church discipline, do it God's way. Don't be a mean Christian. Don't be hard. Love God's people through their mess because somebody loved you and prayed for you when you was out there doing your mess. So you have a blessed day in the Lord. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.